All right, and we are ready with our first presentation for today. So please join me, welcoming Lionel, who will speak about uh, harnessing the arc condition system or maybe something else. Anyway, please welcome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lionel. I work at our studio in the Tidyverse team. And I will talk to you about how to improve errors. And so I will touch a bit on the R condition system uh, because it's really the, the backbone for error messages and warnings uh, in R. Uh, so they are a bit like exceptions in other languages like Java or C++, uh, but they are much richer and kind of underused in R. Uh, we don't use the full uh, possibilities of the, what they can do. And so what we are trying to do is to exploit some of uh, these features. And uh, yeah, the, the original topic was harness the R condition system, which was maybe a bit ambitious for 20 minutes. And so instead, I'm going to talk to you about how to improve errors. So the goal is to find a happy place between uh, this kind of errors where you don't know uh, what is really going on, and this type of reporting where Th there is maybe too much information. And so this is part of uh, undergoing efforts uh, in the, for the tidyverse where we try to have better errors. Uh, so we now have uh, some guidelines to have uh, more consistent messages. And uh, we are trying now to incorporate contextual information within the errors to give uh, more information when something went, went wrong. And the way we do that, uh, why is it possible, is that because errors are actually regular R objects, which are called the conditions. And you can subclass them, and you can store data in them. That's what we are going to see uh, now. So conditions, uh, they are known as exceptions in other languages, but in R it's a bit different because it's not only errors. You, can, you also have warnings and messages, for example. Uh, they are usually completely invisible to the user, except for the condition message when you have uh, an error or a warning. And the fact that uh, they are kind of transient and elusive, uh, how can you get your hand on a condition object then? How can they be tangible? Well, I'm going to use this running example. I hope that you can read some of it. Uh, so it's a simple uh, function fetch x that will fail half of the time. And uh, I will call stop, uh, I cannot fetch. And then I, ha I have this second function calc y that calls fetch x and then uh, adds one to it. And yeah, and if it fetch x didn't stop, it returns 10. So it's a simple example, we get 10 and then we add one to it. And so if we are lucky and there was no error, uh, we get uh, this kind of call stack, like in the diagram there, uh, where you start from the global environment, you call calc y, calc y calls fetch x, then fetch x returns 10, and then you add one to that, and you return 11, and you get your result. And when there is an error, uh, actually, uh, you have to make a shortcut. You have to jump. Uh, because if we cannot compute uh, the, the value from fetch x, then it doesn't make sense for calc y to continue running. Like it, it doesn't know what to do. And so the only same thing is to jump to the global environment. So this is usually what an error is about. And so how can you see a condition object? Uh, well, with try catch, which is a base R function, uh, that allows you to provide an alternative behavior when there is an error. And so it works like this. You define an error handler. Uh, here it's a simple function that always returns zero. Uh, and then you use try catch with error I call my, my handler, and you call whatever R code you want. And so if there was no error, you get uh, the normal results, which is 11 in this case. And if th there was an error, then the handler is called, and it returns, uh, here in this case, it will return zero. And so it looks like this. Uh, we still have a jump from fetch x, but this time try catch will catch the error and then we return zero uh, as a normal value. And you see that the error handler, uh, it's a function of one argument, actually. We haven't used it here, but uh, what if we return this argument? Just like that. 
then we'll get uh, this funny little object, simple error here. And this is actually the condition object. And so uh, in this case, we have the jump, try catch, catch the, the condition, and it returns it as an, as an object. So this is the, uh, the main pattern. You create a condition with a condition signaler, like stop warning a message. And then you can inspect it with a condition handler, uh, such as with try catch. And so if we save the condition in an object, we can do whatever we want with it, and we can call str on it. And then we see that it's actually a regular S3 object. Uh, it has a class, simple error, error and condition, all the conditions inherit from condition. And it has fields, uh, in this case, message and call, uh, which is used to display the error message. So the, there are uh, special classes of conditions in base R. You have the errors, the warnings, the messages. And even when you type control C to interrupt uh, an R computation, even that is a condition uh, that inherits from uh, interrupt. And R will send a condition. And maybe you can handle it with try catch uh, to do something a bit crazy. I don't know. So conditions are regular objects. And what the the, the main insight we get from this is that if we uh, had more specific classes than uh, errors, warnings, and messages, uh, we could improve things by allowing finer grained uh, handling. And also we could use uh, additional fields in addition to uh, call and message to provide more useful information. And the problem is that it's not uh, really easy currently to create uh, these custom conditions. And so we have come up with these Arlang functions about one and uh, inform. And so the difference uh, between the function stop and warning, for example, in about and one, is that the, the former are really made for uh, making it easy to create an error message. So they, they can accept any number of arguments, and they are all pasted together, and they create an error message. Uh, if you use rbot, on the other hand, you have only one argument for the for the message, and then the second argument is your class. You're going to say, okay, this is my uh, specific class with a unique identifier for this error. And then you can pass in any number of supplementary data uh, that might be useful for reporting and handling the error. And so what we are going to do with this uh, is first uh, that if everyone play, plays along with this and uh, starts to subclassing the errors and provide data, uh, we are going to get more precise reporting and more in fine grained handling. And also, if you use a bot to uh, signal an error, you will automatically get uh, uh, the, these features here, which are backtraces and uh, chained errors, chained exceptions. So, more precise reporting. Um, if we go back to our example with fetch x and we change stop with about and uh, we give the, the message can fetch x, we give a fetch error as a class and then we pass the, the vector that decided why uh, there was an error uh, as metadata. And then you create a handler uh, and then we are going to have a default error message can calculate y. And if we see in the handler that we have this specific type of error that we know about and we know how to uh, to extract the information, then we can add this little bit of uh, information in the error message to say how large was uh, the 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 object that caused the, the error, and then we just uh, make a new error uh, that inherits from uh, a specific class as well, and. This way we have improved the error a little bit, so it's a bit of a contrived example. In this case, we just have this, uh, uh, I can't calculate y because x was too large to fetch, to fetch, and we can say how large was x when we fetched it. And so the other advantage of uh, subclassing is that uh, now you can have much more precise handling. For example, in try catch, you can say, I don't want to catch all errors. Sometimes uh, uh, the errors that I don't know about, I want them to uh, go back to the user in the global workspace. And so I will only catch this error, 
with this specific angle. Or you could have like uh, suppress warnings that you can use uh, to suppress all warnings in base R. And with this hypothetical function, you could say, uh, I want to suppress warnings, but only for this class of warning, because this is, the, uh, this is what I expect to see. But there could be another problem, and I don't want that to be hidden uh, from the user. And then we have these uh, features that are automatically enabled by a bot. Uh, we have the backtraces and the parent errors. And uh, we are hoping that we will make for easier debugging. So backtrace, um, a backtrace is a log of what was going on when an error occurred. Uh, so it's very helpful uh, for debugging. And so one function that, uh, that is very helpful to know about is traceback. Uh, because it gives you the, the backtrace for uh, for the last error. Uh, the problem is that sometimes it can be quite a mouthful. You can get uh, a large output, and it's hard to find the information that you need to help you. And so we have come up with these uh, backtrails, uh, which will be uh, much more focused and easier to understand. And so this is a, a backtrace. This is what it looks like. And so you see you have all of the information about what was going on when the error was thrown. And what we are going to do is first to change the order, reverse it. And then we notice that you can uh, display this information as a tree. Actually, the call stack in R is a tree. And that's because of lazy evaluation and NSE. And so you have all these try, catch, eval uh, things going on. But we don't need to know about that. So we're going to collapse it. And then we realize that we only need the final thread of the call tree here to get useful information. And so that's what we are uh, going to use for the back trail. And then we don't need the, the tree representation anymore. And we get this much linear back, back tr uh, trail, uh, which is kind of a subset of a back trace, which is uh, much more to the point and should be uh, more helpful to debug errors. And so. We are going to uh, include them by default in error messages. So instead of seeing uh, error can calculate y, you will also see the back trail uh, that lead to, to that led to this error. So here we have a very simple back trail because there's only one call. Uh, but if, for example, you call uh, the function from L apply, then you see in the back trail that you make your way uh, from the function to to the L apply call. So now parent errors, um, they are for the case that, this, uh, that, that comes up often, where you call lower level APIs, like for example, if you uh, want to access a database or download a file or parse some JSON. And these lower level APIs, they tend to have quite technical error messages that will not mean much to your users. And so the idea is, comes from other languages. It's quite common in Java or Python to have chained exceptions. And the way it works is that uh, when you call the lower level function, you catch errors that it might throw, and then you rethrow them, but with a higher level message and information that will make sense to your users. And it's really easy to use. So. Uh, we, I take the handler from before, and I just add parent equal the condition that I caught. And that's it. And then you will get this information as well with the error message. We'll say parents can fetch x. And uh, if there are multiple parents, you will get all the parents. And then you can, uh, if so that, that's, yeah, the previous one is the, the error message. But if you catch the error, you can print it. Or if you uh, look at the last error that was thrown, you can print it. And then you will see all the backtraces for uh, your error and all the parents' error. And that should be very useful to, uh, to understand quickly what, why it was an error. To, uh, what, why did the her error happen? So to sum up, uh, the main takeaway is that errors are regular objects. Uh, you can provide custom classes. Uh, you can put data in there so that uh, your handlers uh, can uh, can do some uh, more precise reporting. Um, and errors can store backtraces and parent errors, and that should make it uh, easier to debug. And that's coming soon in Arlang 0.3, 
and then throughout the tidyverse in the coming months. Thanks.